Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Milrad. I'm the founder of Movie Karma. We're a nonprofit organization based here in Los Angeles, California. We focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and social impact in Hollywood, really looking at the power of storytelling, how it can be a force for social change and social good. Um, today, I'm really excited to have here on our podcast, Rewriting Hollywood, a very accomplished uh, American playwright, director, writer. Uh, his name is Matthew Lopez. Uh, his play, The Inheritance, you may have heard of, which was directed by Stephen Daltrey, uh, is the most honored American play in a generation. It swept many, many awards, including Best Play uh, in both London and New York, including the Tony Award, among many other ways of recognition. Uh, he's the first uh, Latin writer to, to win the Tony Award for Best Play. He's also very accomplished prior to The Inheritance. Uh, he's written many other plays. Uh, and most recently has a project on streaming right now on, on Amazon Prime, Red, White, and Royal Blue, uh, which I think also does quite a bit for LGBTQ representation. So excited to dive in with Matthew about his journey, um, his his work as a director, uh, and some of the projects that he's working on now. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast. Excited to have you on. Hey, Jared. Thanks for having me. So that was a long, you're very welcome. It was a long-winded way of saying <laughs> You know, just really excited to have you on this podcast. We, as you know, focus on I think a lot of the issues that you've you've addressed in a lot of your work. But um, before we dive into that, I'd love to just hear about your background. Um, I read that you um, you're a self described gay Puerto Rican from the Florida Panhandle, uh, but I understand have some New York roots as well, which I do too. Um, so just excited to start there. If you could tell us a little about your your, your kind of your upbringing and maybe some of your early interests in storytelling. Yeah, so um, the, the Florida Panhandle part was almost by accident. I, I am by right uh, a New York kid. I just wasn't raised there. Uh, my, par my parents were both, my dad was born in Puerto Rico and then uh, his family moved to, to New York City when he was um, a baby. And my mother was born and raised in New York City. And it was only after they got married that they left New York City. Um, so I kind of always felt like I got robbed of a New York City childhood uh, by, you know, the, the bad decisions of my parents, so, yeah. at least in terms of location. Uh, but that said, I did grow up in the Panhandle of Florida. Uh, I was definitely like, I think my brother and I were the only Puerto Rican kids at school. And um, I was the only queer Puerto Rican kid at school. Um, so if you, you can probably imagine that, like my imagine, my imagination was like my uh, escape, and I, 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 my first love uh, was always theater. I started doing community theater when I was really young. Uh, my parents took me to the theater a lot when we were when we went back to visit family in New York. We always went to see shows. So theater and my aunt is a Tony Award winning actor as well. And so I, I, I theater was just sort of the thing, really, that I had a lot of access to. And I really discovered movies. I mean, I was going to movies as a kid, like, you know, but I think it was really when I was maybe 16 or 17 that I just saw some sort of a light bulb clicked in my head. And it was like, oh, cinema. And it was like, and it kind of like, it really was sort of like movies, then cinema, you know, and, and that yeah. sort of light bulb went off my head. <laughs> and then I was like, um, I was bicycling up to Blockbuster Video uh, every weekend and getting like three movies and bringing them home with me. And, and um, I'm painting the picture of a very, very, very popular teenage uh, high school existence, <laughs> you know. So I think I, I, it, I'm hard pressed to say when the creative urge started within me because it was always there I think I was always my parents tell that tell stories that I was like doing plays in the living room and putting on plays in the driveway of my house and 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 things like that so I uh, you know that I would become a storyteller was definitely not a big surprise for my family because I think art always was yeah, but it was there is there's there's quite a bit of escape going on, I think, too. It was sort of better in my head than it was out in the world for a time. Interesting. Yeah, definitely um heard heard that type of story, you know, for folks who needed to escape, felt they needed to escape. Uh, did you feel like you were I mean, I don't know if you were processing this as a teenager or as a kid, but I certainly looking back felt like I, you know, was also looking for myself on screen in some way, right? Looking for representation mm -hmm. whether that was being queer or in other ways. Did you feel like 
you know, A, you really weren't seeing that and B, that this creativity maybe came from a desire to create a world or a space where you were more seen? It's a, it's, it's a thing that is not necessarily apt to my generation as much um simply because we didn't have that at all we did we had no representation i mean like I, we are grasping at straws you know um i mean like honestly like i remember being a teenager and seeing the movie version of six degrees of separation and thinking that that like that was representation like will smith like you know wanting to blow somebody and right. then not even showing it but like that for me was like the height of representation right. Right. Uh, and and so but honestly, that movie, I know it sounds funny, but like that movie actually was just like, oh God, you can say that in a movie. You can do that in a movie. Will Smith can do that in a movie. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and 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 you know, it got better after that for sure. But um, so I can't even be honest. I honestly don't know if if I was hungry for it, if I thought it was even possible. I think that. I think in some ways every artist thinks they've invented something. And I think that for me, one of the things that I thought I was I was inventing in my head or when I was sort of scribbling away is sort of like queer representation. Um and 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 it existed, you know, it existed in the 90s. And actually you look back at when I started to go to the movies really like like a grown-up at around 16 or 17, it was the 90s. And so, you know, we had a lot of great things to see, you know, you go to the, you go to the movies every weekend and it was something new and exciting to see in the nineties. Um, but, you know, looking back at it, that Gus Van Sant was making movies in the nineties and the Wachowskis were making movies in the nineties. And, and, and there was a lot of queer cinema. I didn't have easy access to it. And you could imagine the blockbuster in Panama city, Florida wasn't, you know, didn't have the LGBTQ section. Yeah. Um, so I had to like, for it i did find it i did i did it was more like in college in the night when i went to off to college in the 90s that i started to like really seek it out and then i went to school in a bigger town and so i i had more options then yeah so let's talk about that that's sort of next phase for you so you it, yeah walk me through sort of how uh, specifically playwriting started for you like did you have mentors did you have people kind of nurturing you, encouraging you? Uh, was that something you were doing kind of in your free time? And then- yeah, it was a little, yeah, all of the above, all of the yeah. above. I, you know, I started writing plays in college. I, I studied acting and I thought I wanted to be an actor. And I think I've spared everybody that uh, by not, do, by choosing not to do that actually. Yeah. To the world, I say, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> I'm sparing them that. <laughs> uh, uh, that I opted not to become an actor and uh, I think that um, yeah I did I had I had you know encouragement from professors I, I I had encouragement from friends but it was something that I didn't I don't know I kind of felt like writing was this sort of exalted thing that special people got to do and I wasn't one of them so I, I sort of like I kind of hid the fact that I was writing from people. I was a little embarrassed to tell people I was writing because, like, and I think it was, I don't get to do that. I was like, that is something other people get to do. Where where that comes from, I don't know. Um, but I think a lot of it had to do with class. A lot of it had to do with race. And um, when I really, when I moved to New York after school and I started to really take my work seriously, I think that's the thing is like, until you take yourself seriously, you can't hardly expect anybody else to, you know? Right. And, um, but it also is sort of fed in some ways by encouragement. And mm-hmm. through a secure, circuitous route, I ended up meeting the great playwright, Terrence McNally. And Terrence, was the first person who wasn't like a professor in school who who filled that void that I was so desiring in terms of mentorship and encouragement. And, you know, we did not have a traditional mentorship relationship. It wasn't like, you know, you know, write a play, get the response. It wasn't like Stephen Sondheim and Oscar Hammerstein, right? But what Terrence provided me was... A, encouragement, B, tough love, and C, uh, respect. And he treated me like a peer, 
even though I hardly was at the time. Mm -hmm. And that was what I, that was what I needed. I didn't actually, weirdly, I wasn't asking anybody to sit me down and teach me how to write. Maybe I should have done and it would have taken me a lot less time to like create things that were worth sharing in the world. But I need, I, whether I realized it or not, I just, I guess I needed to take that journey by myself. But Terrence was the first person to take me seriously. And I guess it's because I was, the, I finally took myself seriously enough to share my work with him. And that was the beginning of it. And then, and it really was like Terrence giving me his approval. I, you know, you, you know, you, 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 you hate to say that, like, it requires someone else to tell you something, but it mm -hmm. does sometimes. You really actually do need, especially somebody you admire. I don't know what I would have said if, if Terrence told me I was terrible at it. I probably, I might have just died, but uh, mm -hmm. he, didn't he didn't tell me that, and he gave me a lot of encouragement, and that's exactly what I needed. That's incredible, yeah, and what a, what a person to have um, guiding you in that way. So you had you know, that that sort of guidance or mentorship or um, belief from from Terrence, and then what what was I guess what was it like sharing your some of your work for the first time? I mean, some of your earlier plays also were I, I've I've seen quite well received, but I imagine there were some feelings of maybe like is this for me? Can I make this work? Like walk us through some of those earlier times of sharing your work. There's like. <laughs> It's it's two things simultaneously. It's like excitement to actually share the work because actually, like if you're not excited to share the work, then it, it, the work isn't ready. Um, but also, like you know, fear, and it was less fear, honestly, that the individual piece that I was sharing would not be well received or would be met with overwhelming critis, critical response to the to the degree that it would just destroy the work. It, and it was more a worry that I wasn't good enough, right? Like, mm. I can rewrite a play or I can start to write a new play. But if I'm not good enough, then it doesn't matter, right? And so right. that was, for me, was really like, that was where the nerves came in. Because I could handle being told that a individual piece of writing wasn't up to snuff or wasn't very good or needed a lot of work. But like to be told that I wasn't up to snuff or that I needed a lot of work, that would have been crushing. And I'm like hearing myself talk about it. I'm like, why the hell did I bring all of this up in therapy when I was in, in analysis for so many years? But it really was like, um, I didn't trust myself for the longest time. Um, and I was just, I think, afraid to be told that I needed to stop for the good of all. <laughs> and, 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 and I didn't ever hear that. And, you know, I mean, encouragement is very, very important. And I got a lot of it and it, you know, and I did make some bad decisions as a playwright and I did sort of go down bad paths and, and I had, and I, I did that in front of audiences sometimes, you know, but that's like, that's, that's how you cut your teeth. That's how you learn. It's how you get tough. You know, it's how you grow that that thicker skin which is so necessary yeah it certainly is i mean obviously now you're at a level where people are saying all kinds of stuff um <laughs> but um i wanted to ask you though about about the characters you were writing i mean even those earlier days moving through the inheritance because um i mean a it's inspiring to see you know an openly gay or openly queer writer write about gay stories and our lives um, and so I wanted to ask you about that and also just the, the, sort of the, did you feel, um, you know, I wonder if you like some of your earlier writings were about, you know, straight couples and, and, and sort of like, were you, were you performing in some way? Cause I felt that as a writer, I think other writers who are underrepresented in some way feel that, um, talk to me about, about that process of writing about characters that maybe reflected who you are in some way. Well, it's a two, it's, it's a, it's a two way street. I think that like, there was never a time in my career as a writer when I wasn't very, very out or sort of settled in my identity. I really did write the things that interest me. And mm -hmm. I always do write the things that interest me. And of course, as a, as a queer man, I, I, I do tend to be drawn to those kind of stories. And, and I think also there's, there's the case of I'm, I'm generally asked to, to write those kind of stories. But 
Yeah, no, my parents are heterosexual. Uh, my brother is heterosexual, and my, probably half my friends are too. I I I, I like straight people, um, and <laughs> and 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 occasionally they can be quite interesting. So uh, I, you know, I I wouldn't say because you know I'm thinking about earlier works of mine and 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 in some of the works, you know, sexuality is not at all present in terms of my identity um but other things are you know and so and i think it's also just a question of like there's a we are multifaceted people generally or i hope we are and i hope i am and um i have a lot of interests and i also just sort of like i am i've always been you know i've never been shy about sort of like exploring my interests even if those, those interests didn't don't really intersect with my life my work you know um yeah um or if i'm at work but my life and my identity and my experience i'm 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 very curious um so yeah i i would never i can't say that i ever wrote anything because i felt well i wrote something once i wrote a play once because i was having trouble getting my what i would probably call my more ambitious work produced and so i wrote something that i thought would be commercial and the irony was that was the last play of mine that ever got per, mm. that ever from here. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I don't know if I would ever do that again. Um, that was actually a pretty straight play, but uh, no pun intended. But um, that was mostly a heterosexual play. But it was also sort of a broad comedy, and I thought that that's what the world needed, and it, I was wrong about that. Interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're kind of like this is what this is what should be out there um mm. uh, well this is what's getting produced so maybe i'll write it too uh yes okay yeah uh and i ask you all that obviously for the for the young for the young or aspiring raiders uh listening to this um i wanted to ask you about the inheritance if you do if you, if you indulge us so i had a chance so just for those who haven't seen this play I and mean, of course the i recommend you should it's been produced all around the world it's set you know in new york and kind of three decades after the height of the aids epidemic um it's been said to sort of look at in many ways what it means to be a gay man today, among other things. Um, I had a chance in a scene study class in LA to actually play Toby and <laughs> your play. Oh, fun. Which, which but, scene? Um, we did the scene where there's sort of the, the fighting scene um, when they're, they're sort of like a, a breakup uh, potentially going to happen. Oh, yeah. Eric and Toby are breaking up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah apartment. Yeah. Uh, that gets that gets done a lot in scene study class. <laughs> yeah. Super, super fun. But I mean, I feel like I possible. also need to apologize to all the acting teachers out there in the world. <laughs> yeah. No, no. It was, um, it was fun really talking and diving into all the, all the topics that are brought up in that scene and the characters that, are, that are, merge um but yeah i just want to ask you sort of about the, the the a i mean looking back now it's been a few years since obviously it was premiered and and perceived um with with high regard like what are your thoughts on the impact of the inheritance or or what has you know what have folks been been saying to you over these years um particularly in the queer community or or even beyond about it yeah, it, it, the impact was evident from the beginning. Like, it was just like, it was the first thing I ever wrote. It's the only thing I ever wrote that was just instantaneously like, yes. Like, I remember sharing an early draft with a friend of mine who, um, uh, like, before most people read it, and I remember this text message from him. He's, he's like, I had to walk for, like, an hour uh around the city because before i responded to you uh because i just i i had to process what i just read because i just read like something amazing and and i do it's true like from the get-go people saw in that play my ambition for it and people responded to it in in a way that sort of matched the big impact that i was going for with it um and from the moment we started previewing at the Young Vic in London in um, 2018, the response was this instantaneous sort of grabbing onto it and holding it tightly. Mm. Um, audiences responded instantly. Um, and so I didn't have to wait too long at all to understand that the play was going to have an impact. Um, 
the longer the longer dawning on me was what the impact the play had on me uh that that <laughs> i think that in some ways i'm still figuring out um you know the 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 i knew in the moment what that what it was doing was <laughs> hijacking my life uh, <laughs> i remember yeah. sitting down with stephen daldry at the uh the young vic, the cafe at the young vic about a week or two into um into previews and we hadn't even opened yet i don't think and he said um well we'll know when we get the reviews if this is going to be the next three or four years of our life but mm. just prepare for the fact that it might be the next three or four years of of your life um if anybody would know it'd be steven <laughs> and um he was right it was the next three or four years of our lives then and once that passed, you know, and it ended sort of abruptly with COVID in New York, and mm. and then we, yeah, it was um, then then like a you know a year and a half later, the Tonys happened because of COVID, and uh, and then many years later, then after that, we were in LA. So the play is being done everywhere now. It's being done internationally, and and. I think it's the kind of thing that it's still too soon to know, like ultimately what that play means. I know what it means to people as individuals. I think it's way too soon to to know if the play will last. Uh, what I do know is that I still to this day get messages from people, even in amid, amidst all of the things right now about red, white, royal blue, I still get people messaging me saying how much you know, they just read the inheritance or they just saw the inheritance somewhere in the world and what it means to them. And so, hmm. you know, that, that I, I, you know, I wrote that play from a place of wanting to heal from some trauma. I, you know, the, the line I always say, and it's not a line, it's true, but it's just a way of trying to reduce this in ways that are is easily understandable to people is that I wrote this play. I needed to, the reason I wrote the play was I needed to examine my trauma in as a gay man so that I could then live in joy as a gay man right. that play was my attempt to examine and expel the trauma uh and uh and live in joy and and that has certainly been the case so that in, in that alone makes for me it makes it worth having done but Stephen was right. It was the, <laughs> the next three or four years of my life. Yeah, it's a, I can imagine probably longer at this point. Um, and so, do you feel like it was it had a healing effect on you, and in, 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 in a sense, to even create? yeah, absolutely, yeah. it changed me. I, it's it's funny. It's like it's it, <laughs> my my Silla was in the original cast of Chorus Line, and she always talks about that very few people understand what it's like to have an experience like being in chorus line in 1976 hmm. and uh i i i live in london now i moved back here i moved here about two years ago and soon after i moved here i moved here right after like a week after the tonys that year and um i i ended up at the young Vic having dinner with one of the actors who was in the original company here hmm. and it was the first time that we had both been at the Young Vic together. There's a really great restaurant in the front of the, the theater. And we just started to talk about like, what the hell happened to us? What was that experience? And we, you know, <laughs> we were sitting, which is funny because we were standing, sitting there at the Young Vic, in the middle of the Young Vic. And we just started crying. Like we were just like holding hands and crying. And, and it sounds mm. so stupid. It sounds so indulgent, but something happened to us. Those those of us who worked on that production in London in early 2018, the experience of working on that play together changed our lives. It changed my life. It changed the, the lives of the people who worked on it, um, and it, it, in in a way that most people can never ever unfortunately experience or understand. Uh, and when something like that happens to you, you you can't help but think of it in a different way than other people. You can't help but think of that play differently. I can't help but think of that play differently than my other plays. It's, it's, 
it was a life-changing, life-defining experience that few people are fortunate enough to have. And I just, every day I'm grateful for the fact that I, uh, for some reason, I, I'm one of the lucky few who got to have that. And hmm. I, I hope I never, ever lost uh, for a sense of gratitude over that fact. Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, you, I know you sat it when you won the Tony, you spoke about the importance of, you know, Latin A representation as you made history with your award. Um, but you also talked about the importance of having, yeah, representation too. I mean, from, from that, from that angle as well. Um, and so it sounds like I could, I can only imagine that, that the response to, to you saying that to winning the award, but also to the story that you told really had an impact. Well, you know, it's, I think it's, it's like, it is sort of, you know, when we talk about representation, I think what we talk about is just sort of honesty and, and not hiding. We, and it, it, there's a lot less of that than there ever was in, in many, in, 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 in Western culture and in, in American and British culture, especially. Um, um, and, and there is a hunger now for more authentic work and, and work. And by authentic, I, I, I almost exclusively mean authentic to emotions, uh, uh, the feelings of what it be, what it feels like to be me. I think people are hungry to know what it's like to be somebody else mm. and to hear those stories. And and I think that um, the reticence to t in telling them for so long was simply, I just talk it up to underestimating audiences because at the end of the day, it's not as though like when it turns when in terms of representation, whether it's the inheritance or whether it's it's you know uh jordan cooper's play in a there's uh, there's there's this there's a rock uh, there's a bedrock degree of honesty and there's a bedrock degree of 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 um of creating without fear of alienating it's not a question of creating with a desire to alienate. It's just the removal of the fear that my story will alienate. And and I feel like we're at a place where we can, where people like myself or people like Jordan and so many others um, are, are being encouraged to challenge audiences and to be honest with audiences. And there's, I think there's, there's quite a bit of it still going on, especially in Hollywood. It's just sort of like of, of of pandering. That's just at the end of the day in a commercial endeavor, such as movie making, for the most part, there will always be a degree of pandering, but pandering doesn't work all that well, you know, it, you know, um, and audiences sniff it out. And I think audiences are hungry for genuine, authentic experiences and and they're eager to hear other people's. It doesn't have to look like themselves. You know, audiences are voracious for the truth. Hmm. Yeah, voracious for the truth. That's beautifully said. Um, and it's I'm, I'm glad you're you're giving us your your truth. Um, all right, before I let you go, if you'll indulge us, I did want to ask you about red, white, and royal blue. Obviously, yeah, of course. Yeah. Probably, probably talk for like a couple hours on, on even just gay trauma alone and some of the issues you brought up. <laughs> But um, red, white, and world blue. Um, this is a powerful piece. I mean, I just, I it was, it's fun. It's, it's, it's really enjoyable to watch. Um, first of all, folks who haven't seen it, it tells us the story of this feud between the son of the American president and and, and Britain's prince. Um, and so obviously something deeper emerges based on the the novel of the same name. Um, I guess you just talk to us about this is your directorial de debut. Um, yeah. Um, Matthew, so I wonder if you could just tell us all about like that journey of being a director and this stage of the first time, and also just like assembling this team and this cast and this vision. In that way, yeah, it was it was a very simple thing. I read the book in early 2020, and I was looking for a movie to make. I didn't at all think it would be this, my first film, and and I read the book and I just could not shake it, and I was just so I just fell madly in love with it. I mean, it's just. For those for those uh for those listening who have never read the book, the book is just so delightful and it's just so open hearted and smart and and sexy and and just you know it's just such a good read and yeah. it's sort of very much unlike anything I'd ever read before. I mean, I think the thing about the book, and I hope the same is true of the movie, is that it sort of 
it 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 does a bit of a Trojan horse in terms of like it, it you think you're reading one thing and you actually are reading another, but it doesn't you know, it sneaks up on you and and we always you know I always said this movie is gonna succeed based on its ability to sneak up on the audience you know it's sort of like my favorite thing my favorite sensation is sort of like laughing 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 why am I crying uh, and yeah. so that 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 you know I just I just yeah you, you know I read this book and I was like I want to I want to live in that world again. I was upset. Absolutely. I was a sucker for it. And I was a sucker for Alex and Henry and for their story and their love story. Uh, and, you know, I just was just like, well, let's just see if I can, how far I get, you know, because, you know, eventually someone's going to say no and see how long it takes for someone to say no. And nobody did. And, and lo and behold, awesome. I made a movie. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, uh, again, I mean, I think a step forward, I would argue for representation in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I go well, to your point earlier, you know, growing up, I don't know that we got to see all these types of stories on screen. Or, no, absolutely you know. not. Yeah. So like, what was, what is the response? Well, to that? Oh yeah. God, it's been great. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, look, I mean, you know, it's, yeah, I didn't make Citizen Kane here, you know. I I I, <laughs> I, made, I set out to make something sure. that would delight, and I set out to make something that would entertain and and divert people's attention for two hours. And I had such great source material to work from, and I had a great cast. And um, but what I have found, which is often the case, is when when you reach for something you can also reach for a lot of other things and i think one of the, the most gratifying things is yeah i mean it's like you rarely get to see a story like this sort of given a good budget by a major studio um given the um the 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 the, the ability to find oxygen in the world it, it, it's it's rare and and we knew it was rare when we were making it. And we knew it was a great opportunity to do something that was long overdue yeah. uh, in terms of just resources for a movie like this. You know, I mean, just budget alone was, you know, they put a lot of, they had a lot of faith in it and they put a lot of resources behind it. And I think too, that it's just sort of like, because the movie primarily does seek to entertain uh, we did get to sort of, I think that I'm learning that the movie really does get warm its way into people's hearts. And I think that it, 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 by making the audience laugh, we do really do make the audience care. And and I find what people are responding to in the film is precisely what they responded to in the book, which is these these people I really ended up caring about and I really yeah. you know wanted them to be okay and it's funny because like you know we're living in an age where you know the last kind of person in the world who might get our sympathy is sort of like you know a privileged white man from the aristocracy of England you know or and even though Alex is you know is is, is a Mexican-American working class kid by birth he's he is now the son of the president you know and so right. um He's he's sort of come into some sort of privilege himself, and and yet that doesn't seem to matter. What matters is the heart of the of the characters and the heart of the story, and that's what I I I was given by Casey and Kristen uh, in their book, and 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 I'm glad that that's what people are seeing in the film. Yeah, and Casey, I think even has talked about the 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 importance of writing queer stories like I think Casey's been pretty open about that too and, and yeah. stories that I, want I was going to ask you quickly Matthew just about around that point of representation you know we've had a lot of dialogue on this podcast about this topic which is like what is representation look like and what is what does it mean both in front of and behind the camera right and so I wonder like you know there's there's always discussion should there be you know do should should gay characters only be played by openly gay actors should there be you know sort of a lot of representation on set um, who are queer on queer projects and other underrepresented projects. What are your thoughts on on that sort of part of the mechanics of making projects like this? I'm allergic to the word "should." I think "should" is 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 bad for creativity. Yeah. Um, uh, 
I, I prefer uh, j- merely observing. It's often better when dot dot dot. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I am very, very resistant to being told what and how to make the things I make. And I always do people the, the courtesy of not telling them what and how to make what they make. Mm. Uh, I find that it's often better when people whose stories it is are telling the stories. I find it's often better when uh, you let uh, the, uh, you, you hire filmmakers and, and writers and, 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 and HODs uh, who don't have to do as much research into the piece as, as others. Does it mean that it's always better? Because, you know, Lord knows, you know, we can also, you know, we're capable of making just terrible work ourselves, you know, we, we you know, we, <laughs> yeah. we you know, um, but I think we also have the right to fail, you know, and we have the right to be allowed to fail. And the only way you're allowed to fail is if you're allowed to work. Um, I don't subscribe to the notion that only queer actors can play queer roles. Uh, I do subscribe to the notion that more queer actors need to be known within this industry by casting directors and producers and studios and directors. Uh, And that can only come from uh, a director or producer or studio making sure that there is a concerted effort in the casting process of seeing as many uh, as many out queer actors as possible. Uh, others will disagree with me. Others think it's absolutely necessary and that's their right. Where I get allergic to is when someone says to me, you should, you must, you have to do this. That's that's when the Puerto Rican Aries in me kind of <laughs> rears up and goes, you know, hold on just a second. Yeah. Um, I find it's better when is is the way I operate. I love that. And that's a good reframing and a, ther- a therapist approved. Uh, <laughs> I spent enough money on it. You know, I got to put it yeah. to some good use. Yeah, no, my therapist, all my therapists would approve of that. Um, I last, last question is just, I, I know you're, you're working on some other projects, which I don't know if you want to mention here, but um, I'm just curious, uh, Matthew, like what are the kinds of stories you want to tell now? Or, you know, what are you excited about diving into next in your creative i want to tell the story of the writers and the actors getting a fair deal from the studios that's the first story i want to tell yeah uh because without that story there are no other stories left to tell so that is the uh, like um you know um that is the only story that is coming out of hollywood next uh so then i don't know for me i don't know I'm sort of like I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, I'm 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 taking a little bit of time to take a breath, uh, and I would probably be doing that even if there weren't a strike. Uh, I uh, I don't know. I've been working pretty consistently for the last ten years, yeah. and so I think it's a good time to. Um, to just sort of take a breath in for myself personally and, and, and figure out what I want to, what I want to do next. Uh, I, I, I'd like, I'd like to be surprised by the thing. I mean, I was very surprised by red, white, that that would be my first movie. And so it'd be nice to be surprised again. Well, I hope you, I hope you will be. Uh, and, and amen to what you said about writers and actors getting a fair shake. I'm a proud sag after member. And, you know, a lot of the folks we work with obviously through our nonprofit are, underrepresented writers and actors and um you know it, it's it's definitely past time for them to to all of us to get a fair shake as creatives um so so thank you for for that um but yeah matthew this is a pleasure having you on uh and thanks for indulging us with your time again matthew Lopez. Thanks, sir. check out red right royal blue if you haven't already on amazon prime matthew thanks again appreciate it thank you